Today's message, saints, flips the script. When God gave me this, the Lord says, I'm changing everything. I want you to change everything today. You're preaching this from a different point of view. I've been preaching and I've been talking to you about recognizing thus far this year, about recognizing the value of the kingdom. Um, reminding us how, of just how fortunate we are to be saved and to be living in the kingdom of God here on this earth. How blessed we are to have Jesus on the inside. I've been preaching and teaching and reminding you uh, and me that the kingdom is worth the price. Amen. It is the pearl of great price. Yes. Amen. It is that field that the servant found the treasure in and the man went and bought the whole field. Am I right? When he found the pearl of great price, the man did a mighty exchange. He sold everything he had and bought that one pearl. So I've been trying to convince you of how valuable the kingdom is and how valuable salvation is, how we should consider ourselves fortunate to even live in a country where we can freely worship. During the dark ages, over 50 million believers were martyred. Mostly in Europe. Through the leadership of communist leaders. Because those countries didn't allow Christianity. Over 50 million believers killed for their faith. We live in a country where we can freely serve the Lord. Amen. We get some persecution, but ain't nobody threatening your life. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, to the Hebrews who were suffering some things, the Hebrew writer set them straight. They were, they were suffering, suffering ostracisms, and criticisms, and they had been expelled from the temple. Many of them had been excommunicated, which meant you couldn't do business in the temple anymore. And, uh, that, and, 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 if, and if you were excommunicated from the temple, the community wouldn't speak to you. And they were really going through some tough times. The writer wrote to them and said, you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. In other words, pull it together, man. You ain't, you ain't going through nothing yet. Say amen. And we live in a place where we can freely worship the Lord. And some of us, with all of these freedoms to worship the Lord, we don't take advantage of any of them. So the Lord has had me um, working to convince you that this thing is worth it. You should be glad uh, to be a member of this church. I love this church. I love holiness. I love the church of God in Christ. I was asked one time, Wooden, why is it that you preach like you do and you preach so fearlessly? My answer came back, Your Honor, Judge, I said, because I can. And I saw the look on their face. It, that sound arrogant. And I said, let me explain. I am a part of an organization that will not censure me, nor move me, nor transfer me to another church, nor demote me for telling the truth and for preaching God's truth. I have a board who will not turn their back on me for preaching what the Bible says. Not every preacher has that privilege. I had a leading Baptist minister to come to me one day and sit in my office. I dare not tell you who he was. He said, Wooden, most of us believe, this was during the time uh, 
when we were under great fire because I disagree with President Obama on the definition of marriage, I stayed with God's definition. Amen. I still don't apologize for that. Amen. Amen. I still don't. And he said to me, many of us believe exactly as you do, but we're afraid to say it. I said to myself, thank God for the church of God in Christ. I'm in a church where I can preach the truth. And uh, now you can get mad and leave, but you can't move me. See, not for that. Say amen. So that gives me power. Praise the Lord. Are, are you listening to me? So we've been talking about how privileged we are. Last Thursday night, I talked about aligning with God. You got to hear it. It'll bless your life. But today's message comes from a different point of view altogether. Today's message will determine whether or not God will align with you. Whether or not we are worthy of Christ. If you turn to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13, you'll see where Luke wrote in the Acts of the Apostles. He was actually talking about John the Baptist, and Luke declared that John the Baptist got it right. Acts 13 and 25 says... Um, this and as John fulfilled his course he John said whom think ye that I am and he says I am not he but behold there cometh one after me whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to, to loose. He said, Jesus is so awesome. I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. Some of us treat Jesus like Jesus is not worthy to unloose ours. But John said, oh no, there cometh one after me who is mightier than I, whose shoes it's you. I'm not even worthy to unloose. Paul wrote to the saints at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. And he said this. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, writing from prison, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called. He says, I beg you to walk worthy of the vocation. Vocation, job. Vocation, employment that you are called. If you are, you, all, all places of business have standards. Praise the Lord. Corporate America has a standard. Amen. There is, there should be a, there's a standard if you're going to succeed as a professional athlete, as a, as a politician, as an attorney, as a doctor of medicine, a doctor of psychology. There are standards. Well, there are standards to serving the Lord. And those of us who are part of the kingdom. He said, if you're going to work in the kingdom, then one of your responsibilities is to walk worthy of the vocation. You're a preacher in this church. You should have been with me last week when I had my elders council meeting. I did a teaching entitled, and you call yourself an elder. If you're going to be an elder, 
then you have to walk worthy of being an elder. The Bible sets a lofty, lofty standards for an elder. The Bible sets lofty standards for being a deacon. Lofty standards for being a pastor or a bishop. Lofty standards for being a church musician. Lofty standards for singing on the choir. Lofty standards for being an usher on the floor. Lofty. Lofty. If you're going to go down to the uh, abortion clinic and, 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 and fight for the lives of the unborn, God sets, sets lofty standards for the servant. The servant can't serve and do his job smoking and joking, fornicating, adultery, and, uh, being a homosexual, and living low, praise the Lord, bad credit, messed up name. Bible says, you're going to do this? Walk worthy. It's good preaching. Worthy. So I'm talking, mother, I'm talking about being presser worthy. Praise the Lord. I want to determine whether or not you're a presser material. Well, I don't feel like pressing. Well, it could be that God don't feel like making you a presser either. It depends on what you bring to the table. See, this is hard. This is, a, this is a foreign sermon because we like to just believe that the Lord is saying to us, come as you are uh, and stay as you are. Now, he calls us as we are, but we live in a day now where come as you are is code for stay as you are. We, we, we're trying to do to biblical Christianity what they've tried to do to the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. They don't, it's Dr. King, it ain't Reverend. His, his doctorate was in theology. And if you go to D.C. and visit the monument, um, you're going to be disappointed when you read all of the lofty quotes that they, that they, that they have from Dr. King because not one of them is a scripture. They try to secularize this Baptist preacher. That's what Dr. King was, a preacher. Say amen. He was a preacher. And now we're constantly lowering the standards and secularizing the church. But the Lord wants to know, are you worthy? Paul says, walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called. I feel like I'm in a Presbyterian church this morning. So few amens, but it's all right. Colossians 1 and 10 says, uh, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Worthy. Do you, when you talk to the Lord, you ever talk to him about that? Lord, I want to be worthy in your eyes. Lord, I, I want you to look at me, Lord, and I want, to, I want to come up, Lord, and be worthy of this. I mean, when I think about it, when I got saved, uh, Sister Robertson, I got the best end of that deal. I got heaven. <laughs> I gained the healer, the keeper, the way maker. He gave me joy. I'm on my way to heaven. Oh my, let me just think about this thing. Praise the Lord. He, he hears my prayers. He's faithful. He's never left me once. He's never wronged me once. Once He promised to always be there. I mean, I, gotta, I get all this. And what does he get in return? Me. Inconsistent at times, slowful at times, sinful at times, have not been as committed to him as he had been to me. Oh my, when you look at the deal, he got the low end. We behave as though Jesus worn out when we got saved. Like Jesus got something that he didn't have. 
Oh, no. We're the big winners. Want to be a winner? Accept Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, the world only calls people winners now who are uh, at movie stars, professional athletes, people with money. I know uh, people with money who are losers. 99% of them in Hollywood are losers, immoral, wicked folk. And from time to time, I take a swipe at them to earn a living pretending to be someone who they're not. And they play them roles for so long, they begin to believe the role. And they don't do well, many of them, in the real world. How many of the Supermans have killed themselves? Man, man found out that he really wasn't as fast as a speeding <laughs> locomotive. He couldn't, couldn't uh, yeah, leap over a building with a single bound. Do you walk worthy? I'm going to preach. Of the Lord unto all pleasing. This is kind of tight, and, and, and I'm delivering it intentionally with a, a, a slight edge to, to, to shake us. I want, you, I want you to see, I want to give you a jolt. The jolt might be too hard for some. You may be taking just as much of this as you can take, and you're ready to get your purse and your hat and your coat and leave. But before you do, let me read this verse to you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and uh, verse 12 says that you would walk worthy of God who have called you unto, unto his kingdom and glory. Isn't that something? Walk worthy of God. So today the question is are we Presser material. Are we presser worthy? Amen. Now Matthew's gospel was written at a time when the gospel was spread to the known world. By the time Matthew penned his gospel, it was spread to the known world. And, and by the time he wrote his gospel, uh, the Gentiles had, were sharing in the church. It was, it was common for Gentiles to be saved. And the gospel had spread to, to the known world uh, at that time. But in our text, we see the foundation of this gospel being spread. We see the foundation being laid for the gospel to actually leave the Jewish community and to go into all the world. For we see in our text that in verse uh, uh, 5 through 6, the Bible says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Go not. And into any of the cities of Samaria enter ye not, but rather go to the house, uh, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But if you read on down to verse 18, it says, And you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. So we see here that as he was telling the disciples, don't go the way of the Gentiles yet, but he lets them know that you will go the way of the Gentiles. And by the time uh, this book was Pinned Gentiles had uh, been coming to the Lord and it was a common thing for Gentile non-Jewish people to serve as Christians as well. In verse 7, we find the message that the Lord gave them. See, and here's what it says in verse 7 of chapter 10. He says, and as you go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John was the first to preach the kingdom. Then Jesus began to preach the kingdom. Then Jesus taught his disciples slash the apostles to preach the kingdom and to preach that the kingdom of heaven is here. It is at hand. It has arrived. Are you with me? And uh, notice what he did with this kingdom message. And he never took it back. 
verse, uh, verse 1 tells us that he gave them power. He gave them power to preach the kingdom message. Power over unclean spirits because Jesus knew that unclean spirits would resist the kingdom message. When I preach to you, there are many unclean spirits who would want to get in your mind and speak to you even as the word is going forth and cause you to reject the word of God. Don't you let that happen. They are unclean spirits and they don't want you to hear the truth. The truth is not always appealing. Sometimes it'll make you shout and glad and sometimes it'll make you fight and mad, but it's always the truth. And these spirits would resist them. And not only did he give them power against spirits, but he gave them offensive power. He gave them power to heal all manner of diseases. And how many know that he's still a healer? He's yet in the healing business. So he said, preach the gospel. And, he, and the Bible tells us that the, the announcement was accompanied by great acts of divine power and demonstration. For verse 8 says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. And then he said, now freely you have received, now freely give. Go out. Preach this stuff. Heal people. Cast devils out. See, because I got to do something. To get the people's attention. They got to know that this message is real. Praise the Lord. And, and there needs to be a demonstration of power. Are you with me? And he said to them, I've anointed you freely. Freely you have received. Now freely give. Are you with me? And something marvelous, he promised even to provide for them. How many know that he'll take care of you? Verse 9, he says, and neither, he says, provide neither gold, neither silver, nor brass for your purse. He says, when you leave, don't even take any money of your own to help you on the journey. He says, no script uh, for your journey. Don't even take, he says, don't even take two coats, neither shoes, nor, nor yet staves. See, at this point, he told them not to take those things. Now, in Luke's gospel, chapter 22, when he went back to heaven, he told them to take it. But, but for this point, he says, no staves. And he says this, not that they don't need gold, nor silver, nor these, these things, but he promised to provide them. He says, for the workman is worthy of his meat. You go and you preach, and I will provide. Hallelujah. Saints. There's a, you've got to allow for the element of God's supernatural provisions as you go forth in the things of God. If the only way you can move for God is that you got to see how you, everything's going to work out. You got to have every I dotted, every T crossed, every answer given before you will move. You'll never move for God. There has to be space for the Lord to provide. Amen. Because, see, you can tell when the vision is of God because God's vision is, is always just beyond your grasp. He says, you're going to have to need, you're going to need me. I, I am the missing piece of the puzzle. I am the miracle part of it. See, I was talking to someone the other day about the, the Daniel fast, and I said many people missed the point of that. The, the point of it is, uh, uh, and, uh, and we was in a discussion, I said it's, it's probably more of a diet than a fast because Chapter one never said that Daniel fasted. It says he's, he, what he required, what he what he asked for. He says, "I don't want to eat this. I don't want to eat the king's meat." And, and and technically, you can't fast from anything that you've never eaten. And he had never eaten Babylonian food. That's he didn't want that. He says he, he says to the, uh, the the man over the eunuchs says, "Can I not eat this? But let me eat that." Now the supernatural part is after ten days. After ten days. After 10 days, uh, they were examined. Here's the supernatural part. Here's, here's God's provision. And after 10 days, they were fatter and heavier than the others who were eating the diet that would put the weight on. 
Praise the Lord. Because the whole purpose of it was to fatten them up, little Jewish exiles. In Daniel chapter 1, Daniel's a teenager. Little Jewish exile boys who had been taken from Jerusalem to Babylonia, a 700 to 900 mile trek on uh, foot, and they were, they were taken to this foreign land. They were hungry. They were starving. And, uh, and the king says, but you all are smart. You have the potential to be leaders and I'm going to fatten you up. And Daniel with his hungry self said, I want to get, I want to eat. But because he loved the Lord, he, he looked at the food. He says, I want to eat, but I can't eat that. Because that's ceremonially unclean. So now God, what am I going to do? God gave him favor with the keeper of the eunuchs. And he said, would you please just let me eat uh, pulse. Let me eat beans and lentils. Let me eat food that come from seeds. Because and, 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 I don't want to defile myself before God. Oh, man. And with the, with the diet that he put, put him on, uh, they were supposed to lose. The, the supernatural part was the game. When you step out for the Lord, you have to allow for the supernatural. See, 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 some of us, some of us have become too carnal. We, we've become too natural. We don't allow for the supernatural. You've got to always give space for God to move. Prayer, I, I would pay my tithe, but I just can't see it. Doesn't make sense to me. As long as you, if the requirement for you to obey is that you got to see, then you may never obey. But you'll never reap what God has for you. So go on with your own thinking. Walk in your own wisdom. And you will see that your wisdom will fail you. It is the wisdom of God that makes all of the difference. The Lord says the workman is worthy of his hire and in whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire, look at this, who is worthy. When you go in, ask for, and you won't like this, but he says when you go in, ask for, search out people who can afford to sow into you. Ask for who is worthy and, and see if they have room in their house. See if they'll let you stay there. And there, if they're worthy, and, and God will open their heart, and there abide till you go thence. And when you come into a house, salute it. Know how to, know how to enter in. Manners. And if the house be worthy, if the house, notice this, notice this. Here's this thing again about worthiness. If the house is worthy, let your peace come into it. But if, if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. When you walk in, if they don't treat you right, if they don't show you the right courtesy, if the atmosphere in the house is not right, that's why saints' houses ought to be holy houses. I wonder what we would find if we searched your house. Praise the Lord. What's hidden under the bed? <laughs> in the closet. Don't go in that room right there. In that room. Up there in some of those boxes tucked away. Says, if you go in the house and the spirit of peace is there, then, then, then uh, you can leave your peace in that house. But if it's not worthy, take it with you. Then whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart uh, out of that house or city, as you leave, the dust of the city may cling to you, even though they wouldn't let them have their dust too. Knock the dust off your feet. So I'm leaving, and I won't even take your dust with me. You see, this thing is valuable. Dr. McKinney said something to me one time that just went down in my soul and there's many things she said but she said this to me I'll never forget she said pastor if you don't treat that which is special if you don't treat it special others will not treat it special if you don't respect what God is doing in your life others will not respect it either I feel that sometimes in our attempt to win people, we cheapen the gospel too much. 
See, we, we've watered it down so much to there's nothing to get saved from. Because you can do everything that you've been doing just, just to get you in the church. See, we need rear ends in the seats. So therefore, we just lower the bar. Lord, after a while, it's so low that don't even mean anything to get saved. You don't have to come out of anything. You can be a saved prostitute, a saved bartender, a saved whore, a saved homosexual, a saved lesbian, saved, saved, a saved liquor drinker. Uh, you saved and smoke. The bar is so low, one would have to ask, well, what do I need to get saved for? I mean, what's the point of being saved if I can be saved and do all this stuff? This new style of secularizing the house of God. We dress, and, and black folk, I don't understand black folk. Now, white folk had it a little different, but black folk, I don't understand. A black man all, all, all week long in his overalls. All week long in his coveralls and brogans and in his... Uh, 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 Blue collar, uh, slave labor clothes. He was boy John. On Sunday, when he went to church and put his necktie on and put on his suit and dressed up, all of a sudden now he's Deacon John. He becomes somebody. He's respected. He goes to a place where he's held in high regard. And that place made him special. I guess now God has given us so many places now that we can go that now we treat God's house like it's not even special. I'm not with that. I, think, I, I don't think that's the way you ought to treat the Lord. The house of God is a special place. I'm not with that. And I show no signs of changing. Amen. See, I think God gave me the right personality with regard to that kind of a thing. I'm not a faddish person. I never have been. I mean, I, look, I think for me. Crowd going one way, I want to go another way. I go the way I want to go. They talk about me, it don't make any difference. Call me crazy, call me what you want. I think for me. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, it seems like to me everybody's into it. Makes no difference to me. That, that, that's a drawback with that. Sometimes you can miss out on things. So you want to be pliable. You know, you want to be able to bend a little bit. Say amen. But when it comes down to things that we're convicted about, that, that's, that's that. That's that. Say, well, you need to talk to this one. I don't need to talk to anybody. Now, they may want to talk to me. I went visiting someone in the hospital yesterday and had a wonderful conversation, wonderful conversation by a uh, a husband and wife, the, the, the husband was a, a doctor of psychiatry. He was a psychiatrist. The wife was a, uh, a pediatric doctor. Two wonderful white uh, Caucasian doctors. Wonderful people. Friendly, godly. And guess what we started talking about? Started talking about abortion. And we started talking about things uh, that are going on. And we just sat and had just such respectful conversation. And the doctor said, you know, well, I I respectfully disagree with you on that. I heard her points and she heard mine. And when it was over and we got ready to leave, uh, and she embraced me and said, you know, I wish you were my pastor. Wow. And I had extended my hand to shake. She said, can I hug? Yes, oh, yes, ma'am. And uh, in other words, when you know what you know and you're solid in your position, the truth holds up anywhere. God, to who you're talking to or whatever, the truth of God is the truth of God. You just got to know the truth. Let me, I'm, I'm taking too long today. I'm taking too long. So let me get to this. So the Lord, uh, well, I need to read verse 15. It said, Verily I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah, whom I just went on and destroyed in the day of judgment than for that city. So, what he does here, he gives them instructions. He tells them, if you read 16 and down, that the disciples should expect persecution. It says, Behold, I send you forth out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents. 
harmless as doves. The natural predator, the natural enemy of a sheep is a wolf. The sheep has no self-defense against the wolf. The sheep cannot outrun the wolf. The sheep cannot outmaneuver the wolf. A hundred sheep can't beat one wolf. The, the sheep cannot uh, navigate like the wolf. The, 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 the sheep eats grass. The wolf is carnivorous. The wolf gets a taste of the sheep's blood. That's it. And the Lord says to him, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. So now I'm going to arm you. I'm going to, I'm going to arm you with being wise. So now I want you to be wise as a serpent. But even in your wisdom, now you can't become vicious, be harmless as doves. Praise the Lord. And, and he lets them know that they're going to endure persecution. Now I'm headed somewhere now. Just, just bear with me a few more minutes. He says, fear not them, therefore, um, verse 26, fear not them, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, nothing hid that shall not be made known. And I tell you, I tell, uh, what I tell you in the darkness uh, shall be brought to the light. And what this particular passage actually is dealing with here, verse 26 and 27, it's not saying everything that's done in the dark will be brought to the light as in every deed. And I know everybody here glad to hear that because there's some things that you've done in the dark. You're praying that throughout your whole life and they'll be brought to the light. Lord, please don't let them find out that I did this. Lord, oh God, you mean to tell me that's going to be brought out? No, actually the darkness and the light that was dealing with Old Testament teachings. That which was, which, which was taught under the auspices of the law shall be brought to the light under the light of Christianity. Dealing with the, the doctrinal truths. Amen. But he, did, he does say this in verse 28, speaking of our physical. He says, fear not them which can kill the body, but are not able to kill your soul. Don't even be afraid of folk who can kill you. I tell you who the fear, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and body in hell. And then he gives them to know, he lets them know that, that God's always paying attention. I'm going too long. He says, are not there two sparrows sold for a farthing? The, the farthing was the cheapest coin in circulation. But he says, with the cheapest coin in circulation, you can still buy two sparrows with the cheapest coin in circulation. He says, but a sparrow doesn't even fall to the ground. And fall, that doesn't mean die, but hop. A sparrow doesn't even just hop to the ground as cheap as they are without God noticing it. If the Lord noticed the cheap sparrow, you know God is watching over you and me. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? He said to them, he said to Heavenly Father, he says, he says but the verily the halves of your head are numbered. Now the average count of the half follicles on, on the human head is 140,000. That's average. Some have more, some have less, some have none. But uh, he says that's, that's the count. And, and then some of us are, are watching uh, uh, subtraction. <laughs> I'm praying for a little multiplication then. <laughs> Amen. I mean, they, they stop division. There's no more, just no addition, just subtraction. But, uh, but he says here that uh, even the hairs of your head are numbered. And God says, I, I, I even keep up with them. So I'll keep up with you. Now, the crux of it. And uh, he says this. As he instructs them and gives them strategies and as he warns them that the price of discipleship, this is the point, is high. It costs something to be a Christian. See, we got to get rid of all this whining and talk about uh, uh, church hurt and all that. All that. Forget that stuff. I wish I could just open up everybody's head and just pull the victim mentality out. Praise the Lord. We've gotten that stuff from songs and from listening to so many radio stations and oh, they make you think everybody's out to get you and all your haters and all that kind of stuff. People are not even thinking about you. Amen. You're not that important. You don't matter that much to people. People trying to live. Folk trying to make it. Folk trying to get from point A to point B. 
Why do you think everybody's out to get you? Don't nobody like me. That's in your mind. That's true with all of us. When we die, they're going to have to pay the police to stop the traffic so we can get from the church to the graveyard. What does that tell you? So now, within his conversation with these original pressers, he tells them something. Here's our text. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my father. He opens by telling them, but he's not opening. He's telling them the open profession, an open confession for Christ will be honored by his act of vouching for us when we stand before the Father. If you confess Christ now before people, if you don't whimp out, if you don't get ashamed of the Lord, when you stand before God the Father, Christ will vouch for you. Christ will stand up and say, he or she is mine. They passed the test. Let them come in. But he also points out the centrality of Christ in the life of the disciple becomes a divisive element in human relationships. Jesus will divide your home. Jesus breaks up boyfriends and girls. Jesus comes between husbands and wives. Jesus comes between mother and daughter, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, father and son. Jesus is divisive. For Jesus says himself, Think ye not that I come to send peace, verse 34, on the earth. I came not to bring peace, but I came to bring a soul. Tell you right now, I come to bring division. Praise the Lord. Isn't that something? Let that sink in for a minute. I come to bring a sword. I am come to set a man at variance with his father, against his father, and against his daughter, and all. What is he saying? He's saying, I am the great divide between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of the world. He's saying those who choose me, who really choose me, will also choose not to be a part of the world. And those who in the world who reject me they will choose not to be a part of my kingdom. And the ideologies are different. Praise the Lord. You can't choose Christ 50% of the way. You can't be a just about sold out Christian. You're either a Christian or you're not. Praise the Lord. See, what we're trying to do, Jesus says, is impossible. Jesus says, no man can serve two masters. He'll either hate one and love the other, despise one or cling to the other, but you can't have both. You cannot have both. We're trying to have it both ways. The Lord says you can't do it. The Lord says you can't do it. I divide. I was told of a young man the other day who quit his Girlfriend. And he loved him. He told his daddy, Dad, I broke up with so and so, and I fasted 21 days for God to take my love that I had for her out of my heart. And God did. I said, Why did he do that? He said, She to ask me. Uh, I told her I wanted to marry her. She said she wanted us to get married, and I said to her, I will if it's the Lord's will. And she said to me, well, I, if it's not the Lord's will, will you marry me anyway? I feel like you should still marry me. And he said to her, you are trying to take the place of God. 
this thing is over. And he was still in love with her when he said it. And he went before the Lord. And God delivered her out of his heart. You know why? This young man, that young man is a presser. That young man is serious about his relationship with Christ. I can't get many claps on that. Because most of us, most of us aren't that serious. We're not that sold out. We're sold out, but we're not that sold out. Jesus said, I, praise the Lord, separate houses. Wife, if your husband leave Jesus, you're wrong to leave Jesus for him. Well, the Bible says, obey your husband in everything. Yeah, but he, he ain't talking about that. Praise the Lord. It doesn't include that. You're not going to lose your soul. Well, pastor, you know, if my husband, if he just wants to go to the club, and since the Bible says, wives obey your husband, I think I ought to go, to go to the club with him that night. No, no, no. You done backslid. Something going wrong with you. No, 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 no. You don't do that. And, and vice versa, man, don't you? She's fighting you every step of the way. Don't want you to come to church. Don't want you to praise the Lord. Don't want you to serve the Lord. Like David. David danced out of his, out of his clothes, and his wife uh, stood up there in the window watching the man praise God, and she resented him. She felt that with him being the king, he shouldn't have praised God to that degree. She was wrong. And God gave David some new wives. Jesus Christ is the great divide. When people say folk religion causes people to fall out, true. Religion, more folk have been killed over religion than just about anything else. True. Yes, religion, your relationship with the Lord, it matters. It matters. It matters. And it should be that way. If it, well, we don't want to let religion uh, divide us. I can't think of anything that, that will separate me from you quicker than that. Praise the Lord, because Jesus is worth it. Hallelujah. Well, we ought not to let little things like that divide us. Well, well, what's stronger than going to heaven? What is stronger than your relationship with the Lord? I hear your parents. I hear you. Your children are your life. You better change that. That's idolatry. They are wonderful. They are sweet, but they didn't make you. They didn't die for you. They're, they're human beings, and you're supposed to point them to the Lord. You, no wonder they, they, they turn out, and as soon as they get 18 or 19, they leave the church. They, 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 they messed up. They made the mistake of being your parent, your children, because you didn't teach them to love the Lord. Teach that child to love God. Don't you teach them that sports is more important than church? Don't you teach them that recreation is more important than worship? Don't you teach them that they can get around to serving the Lord eventually? You're the problem. Oh, I got to wrap this up. I'm, I'm getting tired. Amen. I'm not in my best today, but uh, I'll preach better next Sunday. But I feel something here. Jesus Christ has to be first. Everybody say God first. Yeah, but pastor, I just love him so. This, this man, he's an Adonis. He, he, he looks like uh, uh, he, he's the best looking person I've ever seen. And oh, she's the prettiest. Or, or this is the greatest job. Or I have this great opportunity. If it comes at the expense of Christ, it's not an opportunity at all. Praise the Lord. If, it come, if he comes at the expense of Christ, some of you were doing good in the Lord till you married who you married. Some of you were doing good until you got with who you got with. It put a damper on your soul. Let me ask you, how did it work out for you? How, does, how, how you doing since you traded in Jesus and, and lost your joy in the Lord because you latched up to a joy drainer? You latched up to somebody who don't want you to praise God. How you doing now? Do you still have your power? Do you still have your anointing? How's it, how's it working for you? I cut those ties as fast as I could and, and declare for God I live and for God I'll die. 
Somebody shout something in here. Nobody is worth Jesus. Nobody is worth Jesus. Jesus stands in the middle and said, now I want to know, are you worthy of me? And then he raises the bar. I'm going to preach now. He raises the bar. He says the time is going to come when a man's foes shall be people in his own household. That time has come. Sometimes won't nobody do you like your kinfolk. Sometimes won't nobody screw you like your family. It happens, it happens, it happens. But you got to still serve the Lord. Not everybody, even in your family, are happy because the Lord is blessing you. Not everybody celebrates what God's doing in your life. But you ought to stay with God anyhow. Let me tell you something. When the Lord bless you, the blessings of God will give you fake friends and true enemies but you ought to let him bless you anyhow because it's worth it to just be with Jesus Christ. Let the talkers talk and let the liars lie. Then I see Jesus as he raises the bar. He stands up and said, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Now when you reach the age of accountability and if your mom and daddy don't want to be saved that's not an excuse young person you got to be the only one saved in your house you got to serve the Lord anyhow and if they don't want him you tell them mom I'm praying for you dad I'm praying for you but I'm going on to be with Jesus it's just like the lady who was going to church one night and she was married to a wicked man and her husband asked her on church night where are you going and she said to her husband I'm going to church and he grabbed her by the arm and grabbed her and pulled her sweater and said you're not going to and she looked at him and said I'm either going to church or I'm going to heaven but I'm going tonight in other words you ain't going to turn me around because I love you I'll do my wifely duties I'll do my heavenly duties I'll do what father husbandly duties I'll do whatever I'm supposed to but ain't nobody God but the God of the Bible ain't nobody Jesus but Jesus Christ yeah yes how many love the Lord today lift your hands and tell God thank you You ought to shake your neighbor's hand and say, neighbor, I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than houses and land, silver or gold, riches untold. And I'd rather have Jesus than you. Yeah. Yeah. Ain't he real? Jesus said, if you put father or mother before me, you're not worthy of me. I got all these things that I want to do for you, but I'll never do them until you put me first. If you put your children before me, you're not worthy of me. If you put your career before me, you're not worthy of me. If you are shame to take up your cross and follow me, take up your cross means to suffer for my name. He said, if you're ashamed to take up your cross and follow me to be criticized for your identification with me, to be lied on for your identification with me, if you're not willing to go through these things, Jesus said, you're not worthy of me. I begin to pray. I said, Lord, help me to be press so worthy. Lord, give me power to stand for you. If I have to stand alone, give me power 
to say yes when the world is trying to turn me around. I wonder today, is there anybody here who want to be presser worthy? You want to be presser material? I want to be a believer that if I have to walk away from everything that I hold dear to follow Jesus, I want to do it because he's worth it. Let me close. Jesus got up one day and he preached and he said, except you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you have no life in you. And the Bible says, from that time forth, many of his disciples went back. Jesus looked around after the crowd was gone and looked at the 12 and said, will you also go away? But I heard Peter say, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Where shall we go? I'm just like Peter. There's nowhere else to go. Where shall I go? But to the Lord, say I, say I. Press a word. Reach harder next time. But we reach up and reach up and tell the Lord, God, I want you. I, I want this, Lord. More than I want my dear old mother. More than I want my daddy. Mm-hmm. More than I want my career. If corporate America make me choose between you and them, I got to tell them goodbye, goodbye world, and hello Jesus, you ought to just wave at the devil, you ought to just wave at the world, tell the world, goodbye world, and hello Jesus, I want Jesus, do I have any witnesses in here who can say he's my rock? my sword and shield he's my joy he's a wheel in the middle of a wheel and he's got something turning and yearning down in my soul and I just can't stay away I just can't hold my peace I just can't shut up I got to tell the world about this somebody give God praise in the building somebody give him praise if we're not willing to identify with Christ and accept the scandal of that identification we're not worthy of him LGBTQ and all the rest of the letters you can call me what you want Planned Parenthood you can call me what you want left this you can call me whatever you want. Oh, and I've been called everything. Woo! If they wouldn't beat me, I'd say Nick. But they might bump, they might beep. And they might think I said something else. I've been called that so many times. And you know what? You got to be wise like the Seraphonician woman and know how to stay on point. See, some of us could get, get through if we just knew how to stay on point. The devil knows how to just get us off point. Woman walked up to Jesus, a, a Gentile, Syrophoenician, and said, Lord, my child is sick. Lord, my child is sick. Would you please heal, heal my child? Jesus reflected the ideology of the day and said, it's not me. It's not proper. 
for me to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. Now, had he had, had that been today, huh, huh, did you hear that? Jesus called me a dog. Jesus called me a dog. Jesus called me a dog. I hate you, Jesus. You called me a dog. Now your child still would have died. Because you got off point. You missed it. You missed it. That woman understood she had an assignment. She understood what was most important. That was to get her daughter healed. So when Jesus said it's not meat to take the children's bread and give it to dogs, she said, yes, but Lord, the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Jesus said, what? I hadn't seen this kind of faith even in Israel. Oh, he, you, you, your daughter, go home. You don't have to worry about a thing. We would have been still standing there arguing. He said dog. He said dog. Just, oh, then you go to cussing. Right? Acting the fool. He said, the next thing you know, you're barking. <laughs> you, <laughs> rather than outwitting the enemy and not letting the devil provoke you and get you all, you, you're acting all ugly because something ugly happened to you. Well, aren't you just as bad off as the ugly? Ugly? Don't let the enemy do this to you. You got to know how. Ask the Lord to keep you. The Bible says, let your moderation be known, made known to all men. That is self-control. The ability to stay cool under adverse situations and pressure. You get out there and act like a monkey, then, you know, the people out there, they just see two monkeys. They don't know who was a monkey first, but you just, 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 just see two monkeys. Lord, I want to be worthy of you. If you want to be worthy of Christ, meet me at the altar. Meet me at the altar. I want to be a follower of Christ. I want to be one of your disciples. And I want to walk in the newness of life. So let me be a follower. want to be a follower of Christ and I want to be one of his disciples whoa I want to walk in the newness of life so let me be tell me tell me Good God Almighty, have to say, how do I walk each and every day? Tell me, what does it cost? Well, just to carry the cross. Well, well, you see, I have to be follower. Well, 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 well. I want to be saved, preacher. I want to know Jesus. I want to be washed in the blood. I want to, I want to be worthy of this. You know, uh, the, the, the movie Saving Private Ryan, the, the part that moves me the most is when the Tom Hanks character was dying. And he says to Private Ryan, he grabs the private, moves about a private who was the only remaining son in a family. And they were trying to save the bloodline. They sent soldiers to get this guy. Uh, I'm not sure which war it was. Uh, World War, World War II, was it two? And so they, they go to get him. And, and many soldiers, many soldiers get killed. Um, saving Prophet Ryan. And the, the captain, the man in charge, Tom Hanks' character, 
he gets shot up and as he's dying, he grabs Ryan and he says, he pulls him to him and he says, earn this. Earn this. That got me right there. All of the sacrifices, all the men who died to find you, earn this. At the close of the movie, he looks at his wife as an old man and with tears in his eyes in the graveyard looking at all of his the soldiers whose tombs were there who died trying to rescue him. He looks, at, he looks at his wife and says, have I been a good man? Have I lived a good life? In other words, did I earn this? When I think of what Jesus did on the cross, when I think of the provisions that God has provided, when I think of the goodness that the Lord has shown to all of us, I hear the Lord saying, whispering in my ear, earn this. I took you from welfare and set you on high. Earn this. I took you, I lifted you from obscurity and made you somebody. Earn this. I gave you a wife. I gave you a husband. I've given you a job. I've healed your body. I've made ways for you. I picked you up and I've turned you around. You ought to at least walk worthy of what I've done for you. Don't let it be that I wasted my grace on you. Don't let it be that, that I, I should have just let you die. I, I healed you. You had cancer and I raised you up. You mean to tell me what I get back for doing this? Is a person who don't have come to church, won't have pray, won't have say thank you? You mean to tell me that's what you did with the, with the grace and the shot that I've given you? Oh God, Father in Jesus name, Father in Jesus name, Father in Jesus name, make us worthy. Lord, we want to be worthy of this. You built us a church. We want to be worthy of this. You've healed our bodies multiple times. You put coins in our pockets. Even God for our community. Unemployment rate is low, the lowest it's been since 1972. You've given black folk jobs. God, we thank you. Hallelujah. Well to, well to earn it, Lord. Lord, you, you, you've healed me so many times. Lord, you've touched my children. And then God, when disaster did strike you, 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 you took us through it. And, oh God, you opened the door for me to go to college. And, Lord, you've done, oh, just think about what God's done for you. Lord, 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 all of these things, all of these things that you've done. Oh, God, we want to prove worthy. 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 Give us the courage not to take down when it's time to stand. Give us the courage to speak at the, the appropriate time. In the name of Jesus, give us a stand up for you when it matters. Oh God, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. You promised that you would provide silver. You promised that you would provide gold. You promised that you would provide lodging. And you've given us power. God, oh God, may we not waste the distribution of your grace that you have placed on our lives in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. That's all. That's all. Woo! In the waving of your hands, you ought to wave with authority. In the clapping of your hands, you ought to clap with authority. Clap for being worthy. I'm glad, I'm glad. trying to make us something. He's trying to make you somebody. Live up to it. Live up to it. No. No. No, I just can't let the
the cigarettes go. I just can't let the drinking go. I just can't let these habits go. Why? When he's trying to make you somebody. Why insist on the gutter when he's trying to put you on the mountaintop? Why? Why? I don't smoke. I don't have ashtrays in my house. I make no provisions for that. Why would I? I don't drink. There's no alcohol. Why would I make provisions for that which God brought us out of? Oh, you should be glad. You should be glad. Oh, God. And then if the Lord bless you to work in the church. The athlete is not going to be more proud of playing in the Super Bowl than I am proud of serving in the church. <laughs> Ooh, I'm so glad to be a part of this. I, I, listen, I'm crazy, uh, but I want you to grab somebody by both hands and pray a worthiness prayer over your neighbor Then I'm done. A worthiness prayer. Pray a worthiness prayer. Just pray Lay hands on you, you lay hands on her. A word in his prayer. Pray for that person. Pray for that person. Pray for that person. Pray for that person. That they have a mind to walk worthy. That they display a worthy attitude. That they display an attitude of thankfulness and appreciation to God. That they not look around and act like they do doing God a favor to give God a praise. Woo! Glory to God. That they not behave as though they're doing the Lord a favor to attend church regularly. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. We're privileged today. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, what does it cost? Just to carry the cross. Let me be a word. Let me be, let me be a follower. You can praise God all the way back to your seat. Let me be a follower. Let me be a follower. 